We'll finish off this introductory lecture with a warm-up counting exercise. Just to get our familiarity with MACM 101 material to the forefront of our minds and also to set sort of the stage for how we're going to do counting problems in MACM 201. So for this problem, we're inspired by our local ski hill, Mount Seymour, and the chairlift lineup asks visitors to get into groups of four. So make, it says there's a sign there, make fours, please. And this is prior to loading onto the chair, which seats four people across. So then a natural question arises. How many ways are there to make a group of four? Now, when you start to think about this problem, how many ways are there to make a group of four? You probably start to think, well, what do you consider to be the same configuration? And what do you consider to, consider to be a different configuration? So a part of counting counting objects, we're first going to encounter the question of which configurations do we consider different, which ones do we consider the same, because ultimately it's the different configurations that we are attempting to count. So let's investigate this a little bit more. Suppose we've got a group of three and then there's a single rider, someone who's skiing by themselves that day. How could they arrange themselves on the chair? Well the single rider probably wouldn't mix in with the group of three probably sit to one side or the other of the group of three. And so that means that these, these two groups would join together on the chair as either a triple single or a single triple. So here's our triple of riders. They're sitting on one side. And then we've got our single rider. In this case, they're sitting to the right of them. But we could also have them sit to the left of the group. And so there's our two configurations, at least visually laid out. So we aren't actually concerned with how the group of three arranges themselves on the chair, just that it went triple single or single triple. Of course, you may argue that, well, different configurations mean that those three people could arrange themselves in three factorial ways. We're not going to consider that because most of the time uh, group dynamics are that somebody always sits in the middle and someone to their left and the right, depending on, you know, if they're snowboarding, which side foot their, their snowboard is on, which is their lead foot, which side does it hang over, so they don't uh, bang the front of their board against their neighbor if they, if they both uh, snowboard in opposite, uh, with opposite feet uh, in the front. So there's always these group dynamics. So we're not going to be concerned with how the triple seats themselves, just that it went a group of three and a single, or a single and a group of three. So similarly, there is only one possible arrangement for the merger of two groups of size two. It's just going to be a pair and then a pair. And we're not going to be concerned whether it was, you know, this, uh, these two people and maybe these two children and then another group that just happened to be two adults and whether they went child, child, adult, adult or adult, adult, child, child. Again, we are going to think of what we consider to be different is just it, was it a pair and another pair, so two groups of two, and if it was, then that's it. I'm not going to, I'm going to consider the same arrangement if it went two children, two adults, or two adults and two children. So those would be considered the same because it was just two pairs that joined us. So this is just a little bit of preliminary discussion about what do we consider the same, what are we going to consider different. So I guess the bottom line really is, is if you think about the lift attendant, the person who's working there and loading the chairs, maybe what they would say to verbalize the composition on the chair. Triple, single, single, triple, pair, pair, or they even could say, say double, double. Those are the kinds of arrangements that we are considering. Those are the things we want to count. So with that in mind, pause the video and take a moment to think about how many ways there are to make a group of four. All right, so I'm assuming you paused the video, had a little bit of thought about this. How can we make groups of four? Well, we're going to uh, attack this problem. We're going to, to work through this problem first by just an exhaustion method. So the method of exhaust, exhaustion or an exhaustive list. That just means we're going to go through and write down all possibilities.
And if we've written down all possibilities, we can just count them up and we get our total number of ways to make four. So how can we count the possibilities? Well, we can think of, what if there was only a single group that joined? So that would be a group of four, and it would look like that. So this is, we'll say, one group. Now, what about if we had two groups? How could we have two groups joining together in a chair? Well, we could have a triple followed by a single. We could have two pairs, or we could have a single followed by a triple. So we'll just write it like that. Group of three plus a group of one, uh, two groups of two, or a group of one followed by a group of three. We could have three groups. I won't extend that under brace over until we've listed them out so I know how long to, to draw it. So what could three groups look like? Well, if there's three groups, each one has to have at least one. So that accounts for already three people. So then there's that fourth person that's going to float around and they're either going to be uh, part of, well, they will be a part of a group of two. So there's going to be two groups of one and a group of two. So it could look like two, so a double plus a single and a single or a single and a double in the middle and then a single on the other end, or we could have a single and a single and a double. And lastly, we could have four groups that come together. And that would just be a single, a single, a single, and a single. And so there's our exhaustive list of all possible ways we can make a group of four. And now we just count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight ways to make a group of four. So there are eight ways to make a group of four. All right, so there we go. The problem with this approach is it is exhaustive. We had to actually list them all. If the uh, number of seats on the chair wasn't four, if it was six, and we asked the same question, how many ways can we make six, then we can start to see that maybe the exhaustive list might start to pose a problem. It will be more difficult to list larger collections. And we'll do some more generalizations in a, in a moment. But the idea is that as we start to increase this number, exhaustive listing of all options, that's going to be troublesome. So let's see if we can think of a way to count them without having to list them. So this is counting like a pro. So how are we going to count like a professional? This is counting without having to list. So we're going to have to think of a different way to represent the configuration. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to think of the four seats. So we've got our four seats there. And then between the four seats, we can think of maybe an imaginary divider. Maybe not so imaginary now. We're, we're sort of in the, in the middle of a pandemic. So if someone's not part of your personal bubble, then typically there is going to be some uh, transparent piece of plastic that's between you. Think about you and, and somebody who's working in a store. There's always this barrier separating you. So maybe it's not so imaginary anymore. But what we can do is we can imagine that if we're not sitting next to somebody in our own group, then there will be a raised barrier between us. So what that means is there will be a barrier that is between each of the seats. And this barrier could be either up or down, depending on whether you were a part of the group with the person next to you or not. So this is a barrier which is up or down. So there's two states for it, up or down. 
and maybe we can even represent these two states. Up could be associating with it the number one, and down we could associate it with the number zero. And so for example, we could say, you know, suppose we had, I'll pick one of our uh, configurations above in our exhaustive list, maybe that triple single. So we had a triple and a single. So in terms of our configuration, it would look like, so these three people would be together. So that means the barrier would be down. And then the last person is not part of their group. So the barrier is up. And in terms of numbers, we would write this as, since it was down, that's zero, zero, one. So what this means is I can attach to this way of making four, three plus one, a string of length three in zeros and ones. The first two barriers are down, the last one is up. So maybe we can think of going in the opposite direction. Suppose I had a string, it was zero, one, one, let's say. So what would that mean? And I'm trying to show that this represents a way of make four. And so what way of making four would that string correspond to? So this would be first barrier is down, next two are up. So that's our zero, one, one. And in terms of the way of making four, if the barrier is down, we join those, those people on both sides of the barriers together. And so this is a group of two followed by a single and another single. And now what we can see is that we've got this relationship. One way to make four corresponds to a string in zeros and ones of length three. But a way of combining zeros and ones into a string of length three corresponds to a group of four. So we have this one-to-one -one correspondence now between ways of making four and what we call binary strings of length three. So here's what we can do. We can say the number of ways to make four is exactly equal to the number of binary strings, so that's strings in zero and one, of length three. So we took a kind of object we were interested in counting, number of ways to make four, and we associated to that another kind of object, a combinatorial object, strings of length three, binary strings of length three. And we made this connection between some things we were trying to count with combinatorial objects that we actually already know how to count because we've seen these things in Macam 101. So how many binary strings are there of length three? Well, binary string of length three, there are three, I mean, if we look above, we see, maybe I'll draw this last arrow in here. There's three slots to fill. We can fill each slot with either a zero or a one. So there's two times two times two, or two to the three, which is eight binary strings of length three, and therefore eight ways to make four. So we have the same answer that we had above. We did exhaustive counting above, we got eight. We counted like a pro, we got eight. Which was better? Which one is better? Well, the exhaustive listing is nice because we have them all listed out there, but as soon as we get into more complicated examples, you know, higher numbers, then that becomes a little bit more challenging. Sometimes we like to know how many they are there are first before we then go ahead and exhaustively list them. So oftentimes counting comes first and listing then follows. We'll see with this next example where the power of not having to list but counting without listing comes into comes into play. So what if the chair could hold six people? You know, you go to Whistler. Whistler has uh, chairs that can hold six people. If you go into um, you know, go to Ontario uh, East, they have lots of mountains that have chairs that have uh, that hold six people. So a natural question could be, how many ways could you make groups of six? We could try to exhaustively list. That might take 
a while, and we also might not be guaranteed to have listed them all unless we were very strategic in how we did that. So what are the numbers of ways to make six? Well, by our arguments above, we can think of them in terms of this barrier. And now the barrier just exists between the people. So if there's six people there, there'd be five spots between them, so five barriers to play with. And so the number of ways to make six would be the number of ways to arrange the five barriers, which is the number of ways, or the number of binary strings of length five. And so now there's five slots. Each one can be filled with either a zero or one. So there's two to the five, or 32 ways to make six. Now that we know there's 32 ways to make six, at this point we could say, okay, I'm interested in knowing what they are in terms of listing them out. This information then helps me list them. So it's not the other way around. Listing them isn't going to help me count them, but knowing how to count them first will help me in listing them because it will allow me to know whether I got them all or not. Because if I can write down 32 of them, I know I haven't missed any and I got them all. Let's generalize because in, as mathematicians we like to generalize results. We like to generalize them. Um, just so, for example, in this case we want to be able to see what can happen when the number of slots goes up. So now maybe the question is, let's make 100s, please. How can we do that? In this case, exhaustively listing is pretty much out the window as a, as a, uh, a viable way of getting them. Uh, there's just too many. So how can we count them without listing? We can use our same process we had before. It's just going to be the number of binary strings there are of length 99, and the number of strings there are of length 99, is 2 to the 99. And so there we go. We've come up with, from what started with a, an, a, an original problem about trying to count some type of object, how many there are, and through thinking through a process of um, assigning for one of those kinds of objects another combinatorial object we are familiar with, in this case binary strings, then we can count the number of objects we're interested in by go ahead and counting the number of binary strings. So binary strings are one kind of combinatorial object. In the first few lectures of this course, we will go through the kinds of combinatorial objects we'll be interested in this course. Binary strings will be one of them, but there'll be other combinatorial objects as well, and we'll get some familiarity with those combinatorial objects that will be used throughout the rest of the course. So the first few lectures are going to be introducing you to all the combinatorial objects we will be using in this course. Alright, so that's it for the introductory lecture and the warm-up problem. We will see you in the next lecture.